plastics. What a wonderful material, don't you think? Plastics can be molded in any shape, and it can be taking different colors. We can blow mold, injection mold, extrude, and we can vary various different properties of plastics like porosity, permeability, hardness, thermal resistance, you just name it. There are very few materials that are cheaper and more versatile than plastics. Um, I uh, live in a house, old house, 1960s. It was built in 1960s. And one of the problems of old houses is the lack of plastic. At that time, we used cast iron for all the water piping. So cast irons are uh, running around uh, my house under the slab. And cast irons are great. Their um, longevity or durability goes about on average 50 to 65 years, which sounds great, except that my house is as old as that. So we already had a few slab leakages. Have you ever had slab leakages? No leakages under the slab? to dig that slab around and then dug out and then repipe it, I can tell you it's not fun. If we use plastic pipes, actually flex pipes, they are cheaper and they last so long that actually we don't know how long it will last. Probably thousands of years. If I use flex pipe in the beginning, then I could have saved thousands of dollars on it. It's a wonderful thing, plastics. Another thing that is really wonderful about plastics is that we are actually <coughs> using the byproduct of refinery processes to produce plastics. So 50, 60 years ago, we didn't know how to use naphtha, the refinery byproduct. We dumped that into the environment. And scientists found how to turn those wastes into the universe of plastics, and that's what we are using. But because of the versatility, durability, and the affordability of plastics, we are using so much of them, as much as about 450 million tons a year, as my colleague Roland Kyer found out. But not only that, because of the fact that it's so affordable, little of it is uh, used with care or recycled. So we are leaking a lot of those plastics, more than 30% of it, to the environment. <coughs> they are so durable, so they once they enter into the environment, they last long. So Ellen MacArthur Foundation um, projects that by 2050, the total amount of plastics in the ocean will exceed the amount of fish in the ocean. Well, here comes the problem. We talked about versatility, durability, and affordability of plastics. Those are such great features of plastics. And precisely because of great features of plastics, they are causing problems. And I want you to notice this. The inseparability and inherent coupling of the beneficial features of plastics and the harmful features of plastics. Those two are not separable. How come it is possible? How come plastics are so terrible because precisely because they are so great? One thing that we have to realize here is that it is not actually the plastic. The problem is not the plastic. It is actually us who, in the first place, demanded the useful features of plastics that is causing the problem. If it is not plastics, we have to do something else to fulfill the needs, such as cast iron. Do we like it or not, or how environmental implications of using other alternatives from a life cycle point of view? It is widely unknown, but I can tell you that there is no free lunch. There will be environmental costs of those alternatives, and we want to understand that from a life cycle point of view. But what is the responses, policy responses to these plastics problems? In the U.S., more than 400 cities and municipalities uh, initiated a ban on single-use plastics. In this March, the European Commission also passed a rule to ban 10 single uses of plastics. And other nations, corporates, and, um, and uh, municipalities are also initiating similar bans. But then, well, let's think about what happens when we ban something like, for example, plastic straws. Many of the coastal cities in California, they ban uh, the use of plastic straws. Do we all of a sudden um, 
diminish our need of uh, drinking soda and don't feel the need of a stroke. No. This needs need to be fulfilled by something else, such as paper strokes or glass strokes or stainless strokes, right? What are their environmental costs and benefits? Um, this is one of the reports um, published by the European Commission. I, I want to just highlight the uh, stroke part. Um, here the SUP is a single-use plastics, and this is single-use non-plastics. It's a multi-use base case and multi-use force case. As you can see, for CO2 and some other environmental um, interventions point of view, actually single-use plastics are the best in terms of the emissions. So, what it means is that, well, if you are taking life cycle perspective, we have to face the fact that uh, alternatives to plastics will cause environmental problems, and some of them are much worse than the plastics. Unfortunately, very few policies that have ever uh, been initiated against plastics have examined the life cycle implications of the substitution and the alternatives. And this is, I think, the role that, that we have to play in our community. We really need to uh, mainstream life cycle thinking in these policy uh, applications. As long as those demands persist, we will see uh, the alternatives and associated environmental impact. So, what are the um, you know, demand management perspective. The thing is that we rarely demand plastics as themselves, right? We don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, today I need two kilograms of plastics. We never do that. You know, the reason why we are, uh, we are needing plastics is because we want to drink water, affordable and clean water, and we want to carry those waters with us, and plastics are wonderful material to carry those waters with us, right? So if there is widely available clean water, clean, safe drinking water, probably we have uh, less need of uh, the use of plastics, right? And if we don't maintain our water infrastructure, for example, this is what is happening. This is just last week. New Jersey, New York, modern city is completely out of uh, tap water. So they are now drinking all bottled water because of the lead poisoning. And some of the pipings are using lead and we don't know where exactly those lead pipings are. So the municipality declared that, well, all water needs need to be fulfilled by bottled water. If we have maintained good water infrastructure, then some of these needs on plastics could have been diminished. So we need to think creatively how to maintain, how to manage the demand for plastics um, more creatively. Another bad, as many of you know, is the Chinese ban on importation of recyclables. Right? Many of you are aware of that, right? How many of you have watched the, uh, the Plastic uh, plastic China movie? Great. So it's worth watching. It's on the YouTube. Um, and that was viral, and um, the Chinese administration had to do something about it. And the reaction was, well, let's ban it. Let's ban the importation of plastics. The problem is that um, in China, um, the PET, for example, among many other things, PET forms about 2 million tons of uh, importation before the ban uh, to China. And they have been using PET, uh, end of life PET bottles, almost fully for recycling. And those 2 million tons of uh, PET recycled and imported were also used for recycling. And what they made uh, out of that was PET fiber, which is fed into the polyester garment. <coughs> so now, about 2 million tons of PET bottles are not, not being supplied in China. And then, still, there is a strong demand on Chinese-made garments and polyester garments, right? Then what happened? What China should do? They should still produce polyester garments using what? Virgin material, right? The problem that makes worse in Chinese case is that China uses not only petroleum-based PET, but also they make um, uh, the fibers using coal. And coal is at, uh, about um, twice as worse as petroleum based uh, uh, fiber production from life cycle point of view. So we did a little bit of analysis what happens from the life cycle point of view. Um, this is a more summary result at the uh, end point uh, impact. I will just focus on the total impact because you know, that's kind of easier and the, the, the overall story is the same. So, 
If after the ban, China is using virgin raw materials to produce fiber, partly coal, partly petroleum based, and the end of life PT uh, from around the world that cannot be exported to China is landfill, for example. Now, this is causing a lot of problems um, in the countries like the US. In that case, the life cycle impact in China will increase. And also for the world, it will increase. Because coal is much worse than petroleum based um, fiber. Even if those PET bottles that are produced um, in the Western world are recycled locally, unfortunately, um, still China has to produce fiber using virgin materials and is, uh, is making it worse off. And um, the carbon impact of um, on the, uh, the exporting country will still um, go higher than previously uh, maintained because it is uh, displacing the domestically produced fiber. The only scenario that we tested that has a lower uh, impact than the previous case is that well, if locally recycled PET bottles are displacing Chinese made fiber, then we see globally and also from China there are lower environmental impact from the life cycle point of view. So the message here is that well if we just ban it, ban something without really understanding what are the life cycle implications due to substitution and replacement, we may actually not achieve what was intended by the policy. So understanding the structure from the life cycle point of view is really crucial in sound policy making. Of course, we're preaching to the choir, and we need to have policymakers around this table, around this seat, instead of all of us. Finally, I think it, I cannot emphasize more that we should not blindly focus on one single issue. That was really from the beginning in the life cycle community was the really the focus. Um, although marine injury and the issues of plastics very very important, we should not forget that there are other pressing environmental issues such as climate change. So that's what we have looked into, and as our chair kindly mentioned, uh, we just published a, a paper in Nature Climate Change. They're very proud it was selected as a cover. It looks very glamorous here, but it, uh, actually this is how it was taken <laughs> by our graduate students in my lab. And I'm particularly proud of their creativity of using readily available material in the lab, such as a, a blue bottle, um, as, a, as an instrument to take these pictures. So what we have done with this paper is that, well, if we continue our trajectory of producing plastics, um, then by 2050, the plastics life cycle would contribute about 17% of the total carbon budget that we have in order to maintain below 2 degrees Celsius um, increment from the pre-industrial era. 17% of the total carbon budget is coming from plastic. We cannot afford that. Making things worse, if we incinerate or compost all the plastics by then, well, it will go even higher. It will be here. If we incinerate, sorry, there, there's another color that is not visible. So if we incinerate or compost all of them, it will go even higher. If we recycle 100%, yes, it will be lower, but still, you know, as compared to the current stage, it, we will more than double the greenhouse gas emissions from the plastic life cycle. And if we use 100% coal, we will be lower, but still is higher than uh, the current stage. And this is a 100% sugarcane case. Again, it's a lower than corn, but still above the current stage. If we, uh, another thing that is very important to understand here is that if we're using corn-based plastics, 100% of plastics are fulfilled by corn-based plastics, if that's possible, um, and if we compose all of them, then well, we will not have a marine nutrient problem, right, if we compose all of them. However, the greenhouse gas emissions from plastics life cycle will be higher than petroleum-based plastics under the, um, the current uh, end-of-life technologies. So always there are trade-offs, there's no free lunch, and this is one of the lessons from life cycle perspective we have been, we are very familiar with. If we, however, um, connect our energy systems into 100% renewable, then we see uh, a huge reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions from plastics. And if we maintain the growth rate um, below 2% a year, currently it's a 4% a year of uh, growth in uh, plastics. 
reduction, that we also see quite significant reduction, but still is above the current level. Only when we combine all of them, renewable energy, reduced consumption growth, and the use of biomass feedstock and recycling together, then we can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from the life cycles of plastics quite substantially from the current stage. So it really emphasizes the importance of concerted action, multiple combinations of strategy needed in order to really curb down uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from life cycles of plastics. So this is my last slide. So take a message. First, don't just ban it, please. Let's think about what happens after the ban and what are their life cycle implications. I think we should really engage our policymakers on exactly this point. Um, life cycle community has grown a lot thanks to our you know, seniors uh, sitting around here. Um, it's great that we have grown as a community. However, still I think there is a long way to go for mainstreaming life cycle thinking and policy decisions. I think this is the task that we um, have to face. Second, understanding the substitution patterns and creating the framework conditions that incentivize environmentally benign substitution is really the key. This is really the, the essence of these policies. Third, the creative demand reduction approach should be explored. It's not just about material A versus material B. Can we um, collectively reduce the demand on the need of those functionalities? Combination of strategies including decarbonizing energy, recycling, the use of biomass feedstock is crucial for climate change. And lastly, life cycle thinking and understanding of the trade-offs should form the basis of all sound policy. And this is our homework.